message of today is entitled, Take the Initiative or Stay Defeated. Take the Initiative or Stay Defeated. You must take the initiative to be delivered from your own peculiar bondage or you will remain defeated. You must save yourself. Nobody can save you but yourself. There's too many people, too many Christians, they are afraid to act decisively. And usually, when people act decisively, it is in for their own benefit, it's for their own deliverance from their own particular bondage. And Christians must learn to act responsibly and not always react. Most Christians never act responsibly and take the initiative for their own deliverance. They always react. React is not faith. Everybody responds in kind to everything. That's not faith. That's impulse. Good Lord, animals act like that. That's a kind of an instinctive thing. Impulse is... When we act responsibly, it's because we are acting in faith upon the Word of God with our mind in gear, our heart, and our spirit all tied in to that response that has to do with our peculiar bondage and brings us deliverance if we act decisively and we take the initiative because of the faith of our own hearts and not somebody pushing on us. You can't have nobody to push you to deliverance. They might bring you. There's a beautiful story in the Bible. Didn't even intend to include it in the message today, but it's about the man with the palsy. And Jesus was in a house teaching on an occasion. And all of a sudden, the roof started coming off. It wasn't a tornado. It wasn't a hurricane. It wasn't a cyclone. It was four fellas with a man sick of the palsy. They tried to get him in the house. And there was such a crowd. The Bible said the press was there. The press is always there. That's what ruins everything, the press. Talking about these old reporters. Of course, that wasn't all that was there. They were there too. But there was just a crowd pressing to get up close to where Jesus was. And they couldn't get by him. They wouldn't let him through. So you know what they did? Somehow or another, I don't know how they got up there with that man, but they got on top of that house and had a tile roof. And they tore the tile off big enough to let that man down on a stretcher with four ropes, four hands, right down there in front of Jesus. Now, boy, that's some determination. That's taking the initiative, isn't it? Yeah. That ain't responding. That's acting. That's, right. that's why average Christian is always bound or halfway bound or in a mess. You don't act in your own behalf. You just respond to when the devil attacks. Then you start groaning and murmuring and complaining. That is not taking a step of faith. It's really a step backwards because you're not acting decisively. All right, 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, beginning in just the last two verses of that chapter, 15 and 16. Remember the message is entitled, Take the Initiative or Stay Defeated. All right, reading the scripture. Meditate upon these things. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, these things that the apostle has written by the Holy Ghost, so that thy profiting may appear to all, so that people can look at you and tell, as the early apostles, after they got beat on one occasion in Acts the fourth chapter, the Bible said they went before the Sanhedrin court and they took note of them that they had been with Jesus. See, the Holy Scripture says here by the Spirit of God that God wants your profiting to be obvious, to appear to everybody else that you have taken the initiative and been delivered from your particular bondage. Verse 16, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, not just believing it, not just responding or reacting to it, but in doing it, acting, obeying it, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. That means hear thee when you have acted decisively, you found out it works, you obey the word of God, and it's manifest to everybody, the Bible says then that you're saving yourself 
And you're also going to say to those people that hear thee. That don't mean to listen to the average Christian now. That ain't what it's advocating. You listen to the average Christian, you're going to be in a mess. You'll be a bigger bonehead than they are. The Bible says here, after you've meditated upon these things that are written, after you've given yourself wholly to them, completely to them, mm -hmm. and after you're profiting, after you found out it works, and the profit that results from it in your life is obvious to everybody around you, then you be sure to take heed to yourself to stay with that same faith, with that same obedient action on your part, you take heed to obedience, continue in what you prove to be true and profitable, and then in doing this, you're saving yourself, and people that hear you, you can save them. Hey, but there's, you know what the average Christian wants to do? They haven't meditated upon these things totally. They haven't given themselves wholly to them. Their prophet hasn't appeared at all. And they're out trying to teach everybody else. <coughs> you ain't going to save them. You've got to give yourself to the facts of the Word of God. And then you act and take the initiative to put yourself in a position that you can say, Hey, look what happened to me. Well, that's what the, the, the average individual does out here in the marketplace and in your neighborhood and on the streets and in the uh, shop. They look at you and you say, hey, I'm a Christian. I met Jesus. And they look at what happened to you. They say, Ooh, if that's what happens, <laughs> I don't want to meet him. You know that? Yeah. That's what the average Christian breeds is contempt. Yes, they do. I like them verses, but I tell you one thing, there's more implications there than what lies out on the surface. You got to dig under. Meditate upon these things. Verse 11, the great apostle Paul said, these things command and teach. That's why we recommend 1 Timothy and also 2 Timothy to be some of your most where you place the most emphasis and the most ardent part of your studying and memorization in Timothy. Well, there's a lot hangs in the balance on what Paul said and our acting out, you know, obediently what he's written to us here by the Holy Ghost. All right, then he backs up here in verse 6. He said, if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things that I'm teaching you, that is, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. Good doctrine. <laughs> Whereunto thou hast obtained. But wait a minute. The next verse is a warning. He said, but refuse profane and old wise fables. You know what profane means? It means something that is uh, worse than secular. Secular is sometimes used as an anonym for it. Or a synonym, rather, for profane. But it means, profane means something worse than that, than just secular. There's a lot of secular things are not too evil. They're not, uh, they're not holy, but they're not what we call evil. But profane means they are absolutely the antithesis of what God accepts. Yeah. They're the antithesis. They're the very opposite. They're rejected of God. They're spurious is another word to use. And profane, something that God does not honor. It means it rejects that which is holy. That, that's the best definition, in my opinion. If somebody that's profane rejects that which is holy. So he said, refuse profane and old wives' fables. But women, not necessarily just women, but many women just sit around and talk about some old fable. Well, isn't that what Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4? He said the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own love shall they heat to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they'll turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to what? Fables! Boy, well, people sit around and concoct doctrines that the devil wouldn't even have, honor, much less God. I mean Christians! Oh, I tell you, something happened to me. They remind you of Job's comforts. That old first one, Eliphaz, you know, 
Job 5. He said, oh, a certain thing happened to me. He said, I was laying in bed one night and the spirit came in the room and the hairs of my hair stood up. And I heard a voice out of the darkness say, can man be more righteous than God? <laughs> he goes on and tells his vision, his old dream or whatever it was. Bull. I ain't done to that mess. The Bible. Yes. The Bible don't corroborate it. It is profane. That's right. It ain't just secular. It's profane. Lord have mercy. Boy, I like this fellow Paul. He tells you something the Holy Ghost tells him, gives him as a command to us, and then he tells you why. I mean, it's the most reasonable writing you read in the Bible. He writes a commandment, and then he tells you why. The Holy Ghost gave it to us. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. But I like that last verse again. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. If you don't want to stay defeated, if you'll take the initiative, if you'll meditate upon these things that this blessed old man of God that had the, rep the revelation of the dispensation of the grace of God and six other mysteries, seven in all that was revealed to this great man, it's worth taking your time to study it diligently. And then in studying it, you're not going to have your mind open to all the truth. You're going to have to get it just like you're getting it here this morning. Yes. You're going to have to get it from the man that God reveals it to. Right. But still, if you know it, you know it's there, then it's easier for your mind to get the right concept when you already know it. Right. It is much easier. Why the Lord teaches me, and I already know it, but I didn't knew what was a what the real revelation that lie dormant and hidden from the eyes of men praise God but when the Holy Ghost brings out the light on it then it's for every one of us to take heed so he says take heed unto yourself thyself take heed to yourself take heed to the doctrine continue in them for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself Who's the most important person in the world to you? You need to tell me it's somebody else. Oh, yeah. I hate somebody even insinuate that. I know he's a liar. The truth's not in him. Excuse me a minute. Oh, I tell you, I just love other people better than love myself. No, you don't. You love that fella you see in that mirror when you shave or when you brush your teeth or when you crimp. That's the one you love the best. Don't you tell me nothing else. None of better. Praise the Lord. You better think about it that way. It's the way it's supposed to be, by the way. Sure. You can't save nobody else. People, I tell you, this busybodies in this country and in the church of Jesus Christ are so busy trying to save somebody else, they're going to lose themselves. Yeah. They'll lose themselves thinking they're saving somebody else. Now, there's a way that you can save yourself and somebody else, too. Yeah. And this is it. Right. You can't respond and save anybody. You have to act and act decisively. God have mercy sakes. You can be out there trying, that's like you see somebody in a bloody wreck. You can't go up there and save the people in that wreck. You'll kill them trying to help them. you got to have the medics, the rescue squad. They've been trained. If there's any hope, that's the hope lies in that rescue squad that has been trained to handle people with bro broken bones and terrible bleedings and unconscious people and things like that. Maybe they're trapped in a vehicle. Then you're going to have to have a record and a torch and so forth. And you can mess with them and you can kill the very person you're trying to save. And that's what's happening today in the church of Jesus Christ. We've got too many people trying to save somebody else and they're not taking heed to their own needs, to themselves to meditate upon these things, to give themselves wholly to these things, that their property may appear to everybody else. Hey, if you're going to help somebody else, you've got to look the part. God have mercy. You see a lifesaver down on the beach come down there dressed up in a ski suit, and I mean, you know, like to ski on the mountain. I don't mean to ski in the water. And there's somebody there drowning, and he's got on a big old parka, and long handles and combat boots. Now, wouldn't that be cute? He wouldn't save nobody and get drowned himself. No, that's not the way. You prepare, you dress, you look the part. 
And another thing, you had to be strong. A drowning man can drown you if you're not strong. He'll fight you and pull you down and drown you first. And let me tell you something. Saving another person is no small matter. You had to be strong yourself. You have to appear to be strong. Your profiting must be obvious. Hey, I met Jesus. He changed my life. And look what he did for me. Look what I am as a result of it. Yeah, most people look and say, mm -hmm. They're turned off and stood it turned off. But they look at the average big mouth Christian. It turns them off. No wonder Paul, Paul the Apostle again said, writing to the Thessalonican church in 1 Thess First Thessalonians 4 11, study to be quiet. And to do your own business. And to work with your own hands. Praise God. Boy, that old brother had more good advice than anybody I ever heard tell him. <laughs> and you know the church don't like it. No. Oh, Lord, that brother Paul, he didn't like women. That brother Paul, boy, he was a hard old cuss. No, he wasn't either. He was a Lord's choice apostle. He chose him to give him the revelation of the church, the mystery of godliness, the mystery even of Israel. Lord, have mercy. Give him the revelation of the dispensation of the grace of God, and you can't get saved. I don't believe we'd ever get saved if it wasn't for the apostle Paul and what he wrote. Oh, you might get to the door, but I don't believe you'd get in and stay in if we didn't have the writing of Paul about crucifying the old man, sanctification, right. you know, godliness, you know, cleaning yourself up from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Who else wrote it? Nobody like Brother Paul. That's right. Praise God. And nobody wrote it like he did so beautifully in how to save yourself along with somebody else to be a life saver. That you can truly save yourself that's the most important person in the world is you. Ain't nobody else going to save you. You had to work out your own salvation. That's another thing he said. Philippians 2 and 12. And wherefore, brethren, he said, if you've always obeyed, not only in my absence, presence, but also in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God which worketh in you, both the will and the do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Hmm. You may be like to the midst of a crooked and perverse nation upon whom, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, he says. I want what I wrote to you to prevail. I want it to profit. So in the day of Christ, I can rejoice when I see all that host coming in that studied the Pauline epistles, and it helped them to make it, it's going to make me rejoice. <laughs> Praise God. Make you rejoice to bring somebody along with you. Just hey, one. Yeah. Just one. Yeah. And the Bible says, take heed to yourself and unto the doctrine. The doctrine Paul has writ is right, is written. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. There's a lot of doing to be done. We must act decisively. Not just respond or react. We must take the initiative for our own deliverance, for our own salvation, for our own safety, or we will go through life defeated and stay depressed and discouraged and disillusioned and disheartened. And anything else that starts with a D that's bad, you'll have it. God don't want you to go through life like that. It's not his will. Go to Jesus. This is something for you to do, though, for you to take the initiative and act in your own behalf for your deliverance from the bondage of the devil and the flesh. I don't give a hoot who you are. You've got the flesh to contend with. You've got the devil to war against, to resist. Well, that's warfare if you resist somebody trying to get away from them. Isn't that right? Of course it is. Go to Jesus. We sang that chorus this morning in this service about David stood before Goliath and his sling. We kind of messed it up in a way. But anyway, it's got a lot of truth in it. I like that part where it got to, to the 
part of the stanza about David and said, he slung the rock. If he hadn't slung that rock, there wouldn't be no dead giant. He slung the rock.
yourself. Now, he's boasting. He said, the Lord delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, and he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, the Lord be with thee. Saul put his armor on him. David shook him off. He said, I cannot go with these. I've not proved them. I have approved this mess of military equipment. I have something else I've proved. You don't have one right, Christian, to talk about your faith until you have proof. Right. Big mouths is what's ruined in the Christian world. Big old mouths of Christians that ain't never proved that their faith can stand a real test. The final examination that God can throw at you and where if you're just giving time. How about you get in the jaws of death and lay there for days? How about one of your loved ones are dead? The hearse backs up to the door and hauls one of your closest of kin away. What about when you're dead broke, stay broke? The wolf at one door and the bill collector at the other for months and months on end. You had to live by faith out of a cupboard like the old Mother Hubbard. The cupboard was bare. <laughs> Praise God. You better try it. You don't know what you got. All right. Verse 40. He took his staff, chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a script. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew it near to the Philistine. The Philistine drew near to David. And the man that bare the shield went before him. He had a fellow out in front of him beside all that heavy armor. He had a guy there with a big old metal steel shield and that armor bearer had that thing on his hand arm I guess and he was crouched down behind him that was for save himself <laughs> and then that would get behind him with him his job was to protect that Philistine if he came in as a sword then he was to rise up or maneuver to deflect or stop that sword if it was a rock deflect or stop the rock Whatever. He wasn't out there to save his life. He was there to save the life of the Philistines champion named Goliath. Well, David happened to be the champion that God chose for his side to represent him. God don't choose you to react. He chooses you when you have faith to act in his behalf. God ain't going to put you at the front of the battle to respond. You know what you do? If you have proved yourself, I know what you do. God does too. You'll run. You'll run when the battle gets hard. You'll quit. David already tried it out. The Philistine looked and saw David at disdain, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. A good looking fellow out there. Little old smooth skinned, fair skinned boys and girls. Ruddy. Good looking. The Philistine said to David, How oh, am I a dog that you come to me with staves? And he cursed him. <laughs> he put a cursing on him, David. The Philistine said to David, Come to me and I'll give your flesh to the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, I got through cussing him. He said, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a shield, and I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. The God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied, and this day the Lord will deliver thee into my hand. <laughs> and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day to the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth and all the earth. I want them to know that there's a God in Israel. Yeah. If it had been all them thousands and tens of thousands of men, every one of them are trimmed. Every morning, 40 days, they go out there and all Israel and their king, head and shoulders above everybody else, trim. Little old puny Christians, they said, oh, I wouldn't have that. No, you'd have run. <laughs> you wouldn't even been close. And all this assembly, verse 47, shall know the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. That's the only way you're going to win a battle when you make it God's battle. As long as it's your battle, you're going to get whipped. It's got to be in defense of God. Hey, I'm doing this for the Lord's sake. For the Lord's elect's sake, Paul said I'm doing it for. Everything I do is for God's elect's sake. When you do it for your sake, you're going to get whipped. 
He said, I want you to know the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And he, the Bible says, the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to David, and David hasted and ran toward the army. But he wasn't backing off as that guy was approaching him, taking common ground away from him there, coming toward him. He's coming at me. He's coming at me. <laughs> no, David got a slingshot and ran at him. Ran at him. That's what you're going to have to do to save yourself. Take the initiative or you're going to stay defeated. David ran at him while he was running. He put his hand in his bag. He took a stone, put it in a slingshot, wound that thing up over his head, running as hard as that little six foot seven guy, a five foot seven guy could run, swinging that stone and running all the time. As hard as he could run and let her go. There, God, there, I've done all I can do. God took it.
He does it as a matter of principle and policy that God has burned and etched in his heart. Keep your rewards, O king, and I'll read that writing. You weigh the balances and you are found wanting. Jesus commanded a man, we must take the initiative to save ourselves, to stay or stave off defeat, stay undefeated, or to get out of your defeated situation. Jesus one time, he healed a blind man in John 9, but he told him, you got something to do. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. What happened to that man? He came back saying, he obeyed the Lord. Another time, he healed a man with a palsy, Luke 13. Shaking, old hands all drawn up. Says, man, stretch out your hand. Well, he couldn't, but he tried, and he did, because Jesus helped him. I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burden alone. Another man, John the fifth chapter, He'd been there all of his life without being able to walk. An impotent man. He said, would you be made whole? He said, sir, I don't have no man to put me in the pool. Because an angel at a certain time of the year came and troubled the waters. Whoever was first got healed. But I had no man to put me in the pool. And I just laid here 38 years in my bondage. He said, arise, take up your bed and walk. Well, I can't. That's what the average Christian would say. Why, what do you tell me that for? I can't walk. But he squirmed and he walked because he did what Jesus told him to do. Now, in the life, in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, as well as John, we find that those that were in distress and would take the initiative, Jesus always met their needs. They acted. They responded to their defeated condition. And they didn't let circumstances control them. They controlled them terrible circumstances that they were in bondage to. And they, through that act of faith, deliverance was wrought. In John, the fourth chapter, I like this. John, the fourth chapter. I want you to turn that and look at it with me. It's so wonderful. Beginning in verse 43. John 4, 43. Now after two days he departed thence and went to Galilee, and Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. That's why I like to go down fishing. They don't treat me like I'm a prophet, but they respect me as a preacher. And a fellow that lives right, has integrity. I keep my word, and they know it. I'll be out there in the boat. Some of them come up to me out there fishing. The Gulf or in the bay, say, hey, so and so told us they caught three, four, five thousand fish a certain place. Did you happen to see that? They didn't believe that guy. They knew they were liars. <laughs> they said, did you see it? I said, yeah, I saw him catch him fish. Well, that, all right, we believe it. <laughs> Praise God. I tell you, I like that. I like that. But that's my own country. They don't call me prophet or. <laughs> Some of them call me Rev. <laughs> Old boy come up to me down there last week. Said, Rev, he said, I need you to pray for something. I said, what's that, Baldy? <laughs> he said, I want you to pray these Yankees would be some mean. <laughs> them Yankees down there, tourists in South Florida. Boy, they cuss and snort. And call the police anything they do to get a commercial fisherman in trouble in a boat, in a car, on the seawall, wherever he is, he's going to try to raise the devil and get you arrested if he can. And there's a lot of regulations that they can complain, call the Marine Patrol, the police, and catch you if you don't get out of there in time. But mostly it's just old murmuring, complaining, and backbiting, and just arrogance going to sea. He, I said, well, I've been praying for him for years, and like they're getting worse. <laughs> but the Bible says they'll get worse. But anyway, a prophet's not without honor. Then Jesus went up to the feast, 
And verse 46 said, He came to King of Galilee where he turned the water to wine, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea and Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down, or my child die. Jesus said unto him, Well, then go your way. Thy son liveth. Jesus didn't even go with him. It says, And the man believed the word, though. He believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and went his way. And when he's going down, his servants met him and told him, Thy son liveth. He said, When did he begin to amend? They said, Yesterday at the seventh hour, one o'clock. And the father knew it was the same hour in which Jesus said, Thy son liveth. What happened? He was obedient to the word and to the doctrine. He took heed to himself in the doctrine. And the Bible said himself believed and his whole house was saved. That's a great result by acting in obedience to your faith in God's word. Now in closing, I want you to turn with me to Luke the 8th chapter. Verse 41. Well, we'll be getting verse 40. It came to pass when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus. He was a ruler of the city gong. And I want to listen, listen to this man's act. Now, he was truly responding to a desperate situation, to a, a bondage of his daughter. But listen to his act. It's more than a response. This is an act. He took the initiative for the deliverance of his daughter. He fell down at Jesus' feet. He fell in a pile right at his feet. And he besought him that he would come into his house, for he had one only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a dying. But, he, but as he went, the people thronged him. And then there's an interjectory event here, parenthetical event, of a woman having the issue of blood that came and touched him. She took the initiative for her peculiar bondage unto deliverance. But then, verse 49, after this woman was delivered with the issue of blood, while he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead, trouble not the master. Don't bother Jesus anymore with your problem. But when Jesus heard it, he answered in him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. Only believe, only believe, all things are possible, only believe. And the best of it is, Lord, I believe, Lord, I believe. That all things are possible if I believe. And the Lord say that? Mark 9, 23. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Amen. Jesus said to this father, I know your daughter's dead, but if you don't fear and believe only, She'll be made whole. When they came to the house, he suffered no man to go in but Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother of the maid. And all those outside were weeping, bewailing her. And Jesus said, Weep not. She's not dead. She's sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. Boy, that prophet had a lot of honor, didn't he? His word didn't mean no more of them bone heads, and yes. mine does the most bone heads. When I speak the words of God and the words of truth. And he put them all out. And he took her by the hand and called her, saying, Maid, arise. Another one of the gospels says, Tabitha, I say unto thee, arise. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. Praise God. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. The old song we used to sing, tell it to Jesus alone. There is no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. But don't come arrogantly. Fall at his feet. Fall at his feet.